We will continue uh, with Ida Danewitz's presentation now. She's here. Making the border ungovernable is her title. Ida Danewitz is an interdisciplinary scholar working across the fields of political theory, sociology, and she works as a lecturer at the Department for International Relations at the University of Sussex. Ida, as I think Zain Yao, has been part of an extensive strike action across universities in the UK, fighting against severe pension cuts for university staff, and I think we can acknowledge that also as part of the space. And she earned her PhD from the London School of Economics in 2018. Ida Danevit co-edited a volume called The Black Mediterranean, Bodies, Borders, Citizenship, published last year with Pargrave Macmillan together with a group of scholars, and published several articles on racial violence and capitalism in Europe. I mentioned two of them, uh, which were both awarded with special honors. One is White Innocence in the Black Mediterranean, Hospitality and the Erasure of History from 2017, and The Fire This Time, Grenfell, Racial Capitalism and the Urbanization of Empire from 2020. Ida is now working on her first book, as I've read, coming out with Cambridge University Press. The title is Resisting Racial Capitalism, Global Struggles for Abolition. I think that Ida's methodological considerations of black studies in the European context has been a great inspiration for me and others, and I'm very glad that you're here, and I really look forward to your paper. Um, can you all hear me in the back? Yes. If you can't, please shout just at any point during the talk. Uh, okay, let me start by just thanking Henrika, uh, Jan as well, for inviting me to come here. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. I actually want to start by saying that I feel a little bit like an interloper in this space, not least because I'm included alongside just such brilliant uh, people. I'm really honored to be here alongside you. Um, but also, in addition to that, because I don't necessarily think of myself as being someone who does affect theory. Uh, and so I hope that you know, I will be coming at some of these themes from a slightly different um, direction, and I hope that that will be fruitful and interesting in and of itself. Okay, so on the evening of the 3rd of October in 2013, an overcrowded fishing boat that was carrying more than 500 people sank off the coast of the Italian island of Lampedusa. Amongst the 368 found dead was an Eritrean woman who had given birth as she drowned. The divers found her 150 down in the ocean together with her newborn baby, still attached by the umbilical cord. Her name was Johanna, the Eritrean word for congratulations. Since then, more than 20,000 migrants have drowned in the Mediterranean, making it the deadliest border in the world. Many of those who try to enter Europe, in fact, lose their lives already in the Sahara Desert. Others die in the back of refrigerated lorries. Some, such as Manuel Bravo, take their own lives in one of the many detention centers that are, that are scattered across Europe. Others, like Jim, like Jimmy Mbenga, die at the hands of security guards during deportations. Like Johanna, like Manuel, and like the 39 Vietnamese nationals that were trapped in the back of the so-called Essex lorry, Jimmy died from suffocation. We revolt for non-rights because for many reasons we can no longer breathe. So my talk today, I want to theorize the struggle against the border as being part of a much wider struggle against racial capitalism, the state system, and their necropolitical terms of order. <coughs> The argument that I'll be making draws on my current book project that which Enrique mentioned. Uh, it's a text that explores the role of state power in the making of racial capitalism. Building on black and anti-colonial Marxist thought, the book develops a critique of state-centered conceptions of radical politics that remained moored to visions of governance and hierarchical rule. Instead, I point to an anarchism <coughs> otherwise and an anti-political imagination that refuses to reduce freedom to, to a question of how we shall be governed and ruled. So today I want to make two different sets of arguments. 
The first is that borders and other forms of mobility control are race-making modes of governance in the service of capital. Borders are not natural or benevolent features of world politics, but they constitute a specific relation of difference directly imposed by the state. From the poor laws and the vagrancy acts of medieval Europe, to the coerced migration of African captives, to contracts of indenture, settler colonial immigration restrictions, and the contemporary policing of migrant lives, bordering practices are part of a wider historical trajectory in which the capitalist state has always sought to control the movement of the displaced and the dispossessed. If capitalism needs an equality and racism enshrines it, as Rufus and Gilmore famously argues, then borders are central to this process. The second argument is that taking this relation seriously requires a shift away from liberal discourses of empathy, sentimentality, humanitarianism and hospitality, and towards arguments in favor, not just of border abolition, but more provocatively perhaps, of the state and its constitutive understanding of politics as governance. To develop this argument, I will draw on the political thought of C.L.R. James and Cedric Robinson. Neither of them describe themselves as anarchists, right? In fact, they were both deeply critical of the Western tradition of anarchism. And yet, their work resonates with an anti-statist, or what I call an anti-political uh, sensibility, which demands an end to the wider state system of racial capitalist plunder and war. This is an abolitionist project, right? but it's one that goes beyond merely calling for the uh, defunding of prisons, borders, detention centers, and so on, and which instead bursts open the much bigger question of what James Scott has called how to not be governed at, at all. I don't know if you can see this, <laughs> hopefully. Um, I actually wanted to start here. On the 12th of July in 2019, when 700 undocumented migrants occupied one of Paris's most iconic buildings, namely the Pantheon. The occupiers were members of the Gilles Noir, that is the Black Vest Collective, which is one of the most prolific undocumented migrant movements to have emerged in recent years. Standing over the tombs of Voltaire and Rousseau, they delivered impassioned speeches about the violence of the French immigration system, of police harassment and of the harsh realities of living without papers in France today. Humiliation, exploitation, deportation, they proclaimed, is ultimately a better description of France than the much cherished liberty, equality, fraternity. By connecting the exploitation of migrant workers in France to the expropriation of African countries by multinational corporations, the Gilles Noirs argued that the same people who destroy our lives over here are waging war on us there. Now, in making these arguments that are very much about the interconnected geographies of extraction, of expropriation <laughs> and exploitation, and equally about the ways in which these things are anchored in the global border regime, the Gilles Noirs put forward claims that far surpass and that challenge the academic literature on migration and on border violence. As some of you might know, <laughs> Uh, in this literature, right, the violence of borders is typically seen as a problem that can be overcome through a stricter adherence to human rights, international law, and to more inclusive forms of citizenship. To struggle for migrant justice is here reduced to a question of empathy and of hospitality. Of course, right, these measures might go some way towards countering the violence that is unleashed on migrants on a daily basis, but they ultimately remain wedded to a political imagination that starts and that ends with the state. This overlooks that migrant and refugee are not naturally existing categories, but they rather name a specific relation of difference imposed by the state. So to unpack this a little bit, I want to briefly turn to Cedric Robinson's seminal text from 1983, Black Marxism, The Making of the Black Radical Tradition. It's a book uh, that rereads the history of capitalism as being a story not only and not centrally about the exploitation of white European male workers, but instead, for Robinson, the history of capitalism is a history of the enslavement, the dispossession, the expropriation and the coercion of the so-called dark proletariat on a global and colonial scale. Robinson wrote almost nothing about borders per se, 
Yet the argument that he develops in this text, as well as in other books, I think can help us think about how mobility controls emerged as a central mode of governance under a global system of racial capitalism. So one of the arguments that Robinson makes in this text is that, um, is that the roots of racial capitalism actually lies within Europe. Right? So contrary to the idea that racial thinking is something that arose when Europe encountered colonial others, Robinson in fact suggests that capitalism emerged from a European feudal order that was already saturated with racial categories, with racial thinking, and so on. At the bottom of this racial hierarchy were immigrant workers who formed a central component of the working classes. He writes, in Ragusa, it was the Mulachi, in Marseille, the Corsicans, in Seville, the Moriscos of Andalusia, in Algiers, it was the Aragonese and the Berbers, in Lisbon, black slaves, and in Venice, the immigrant proletariat was augmented by Greeks, Persians, Armenians, and Portuguese Jews. Immigrant workers could be found in the army as mercenaries, as well as in domestic services, in handicrafts, industrial labor, in shipping, as well as on the fields of agrarian capitalism. So racial capitalism, Robinson argues, was from its very inception linked to the production and the exploitation of, of what he calls the indispensable immigrant. As he writes, there's never been a moment in modern European history, if ever before, that migratory and or immigrant labor was not a significant aspect of European economies. Now, Robinson's analysis of this, uh, I want to suggest, can help us rethink the transnational history of mobility controls. For example, the vagrancy legislation and the poor laws that were introduced in Europe from the 14th century and onwards were deeply racialized and, raci and racializing mechanisms. Right? They, were they were designed to, di to distinguish between the so-called deserving and the underserving poor. These laws not only targeted Romani and traveler communities, Africans, Jews, and the Irish, but moreover, vagrants and other members of the underserving poor were often blackened through an insistence on their idleness, their pauperism, and their anarchistic tendencies. So in that sense, right, the policing of mobility functioned as a race-making mode of governance in the service of capital. Of course, right, vagrancy laws were just one of many tools that were used to immobilize and to coerce the colonized, the enslaved, and the poor into labor. Other measures included enslavement, forced migration, contracts of indenture, penal transportation, and the encomienda system. Whether we're talking about the forced labor of Native, of Native Americans, or the enslavement and the coerced migration of Africans, the export of the Chinese and the Indians as indentured workers, transport of convicts, blackbirding in the Pacific. Right? The basic point is that racial capitalism from the very beginning relied on both creating and on moving a global workforce. As the title of a book by Christopher Pybus and Redeker puts it, many middle passages essentially built the modern world. The racialized technologies of mobility control that emerged as part of this would later the form the basis for many uh, contemporary forms of immigration uh, controls, including, of course, biometric surveillance, the custom systems, and the passport. So two things, I think, need to be pointed out at this phase. The first, which I've already alluded to, is that state-sponsored mobility controls have been a central mechanism through which capital produces racialized exploitable and disposable labor. Whether this happens through, vag through vagrancy le legislation, through schemes of indenture, or through contemporary immigration restrictions, the policing of mobility has been used to fabricate that very distinction between the deserving and the undeserving. It is, in a sense, a deeply racializing mechanism. The state and the market, or law and accumulation, right, are here revealed as being two sides of the same coin. As Robinson recognized in black Marxism, the state-sponsored creation of immigrant labor is indeed indispensable to racial capitalism. Second, this analysis also exposes the deep-seated links between policing and bordering, right? the history 
uh, of mobility controls are in part a history of punishment and of incarceration. I appreciate that we're often accustomed to thinking of these systems as being distinct with their own logics, but in fact, they emerged as entwined modes of governance under the same system of racial capitalism. State institutions that were designed to combat vagrancy often pioneered the use of incarceration, and equally, the transportation of convicts to penal colonies and to settlements around the world often served as a form of punishment. In all of these cases, policing and bordering, incarceration and deportation operated together to produce whiteness and its constitutive outside. Of course, this history is still very much with us. The national liberation wars that swept across the globe in the post-1945 era in many ways signaled the end of empire and the rise of a new so-called post-colonial era. And yet, racialized practices of extraction, expropriation, and of exploitation often continued and in many cases uh, intensified. Older forms of colonial and segregationist practices may have been discredited, but they were often replaced with a system of resource extraction and continued sweated labor in the global south and the increased reliance on migrant labor in the north. Now, I appreciate that these modes of accumulation are often discussed and theorized in complete isolation from one another. Uh, but following Robinson, as well as the Gilles Noir, I want to instead suggest that we should be thinking of them as being different sides of the same racial capitalist coin. Consider, for example, that today 79% of the world's industrial workforce lives and works in the global south, compared to just 34% in 1950 and 53% in 1980. A large proportion of this workforce are migrants, right? In countries like Egypt, Jordan, Malaysia, Morocco, Taiwan, and Thailand, sweatshop labor is directly imported from other poor neighboring countries. Meanwhile, in India and in China, it's instead common to rely on internal migration from rural areas. In both cases, labor migration is propelled by similar forces as new forms of dispossession and enclosure have driven an ever-growing number of people to migrate from the countryside to urban centers. Today, there are more than one billion impoverished slum dwellers in the world, with displaced people making up a majority of those who reside in urban slums. Sometimes, if they're lucky, they find work in one of the many garment, electronics, toy, and shoe factories that are scattered throughout the urban periphery. Now, this process of outsourcing manufacturing to the global south cannot be understood in isolation from the hardening of borders in the post-1945 world. Military interventions, structural adjustment programs, resource extraction, and land grabbing have displaced large numbers of people throughout the global south. In suppressing free movement and preventing displaced people from emigrating, borders effectively create populations that are stuck in what Mike Davis calls the planet of slums. That is, by creating differential zones of labor, borders naturalize a global system dependent on the hyper-extraction of surplus value from racialized workers in the global south, which then in turn enables cheap prices and unsustainable consumption habits in the north. Right, that's one side of the coin. The other is that borders also work to lock many of those who do manage to migrate into a state of permanent precarity, vulnerability, and super-exploitability. In forcing people to live and to work as illegal migrants, borders create a commodified, exploitable, and an expendable workforce, and not just in the south, right, but also here in the north. In that sense, migrant labor can be seen as the flip side of sweatshop labor. Right? This is very much the insourcing of labor rather than the outsourcing of factories. This system right, of creating, recruiting, and of exploiting migrant labor is central to racial capitalism today. In Europe, um, it's widespread in the agricultural sector, especially so in Italy, Greece, in the UK, where I'm based, here in Germany, of course, as well. In countries like Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, and UAE, 
migrant workers that predominantly come from Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, the Philippines and Pakistan make up the majority of the population right, in these places. In China, the hukou system functions as a domestic tool of migration management, which effectively strips uh, rural peasant migrants from legal rights in the urban areas where they reside. I, I could go on. The point that I'm trying to make is that these examples are not exceptional. They're rather representative of a larger system which relies on state power to produce a super-exploited, hyper-surveyed, and expendable labor pool. So my, in light of this and against that background, to think that the violence of borders is something that can be stamped out by fairer immigration laws or by more hospitality is to miss the point. Appeals to human rights, to more inclusive forms of citizenship and to more open borders might of course go some way towards alleviating migrant suffering. But as the Gilles have articulated so clearly, such measures are incapable of, of uprooting the racial capitalist structures that render migrant lives disposable, precarious, and super exploitable. Borders were, and they continue to be, central to the fabrication, the maintenance, and the renewal of the racial categories of difference that capital needs to profit and thrive. So in that sense, right, migrant justice require far more radical solutions. And it's here that I want to turn to this man here, who some of you might recognize, right? This is C.L.R. James, the Trinidadian Marxist, Pan-Africanist, and very importantly, cricket enthusiast. Um, James is often described as a black Plato, which is highly ironic, given how much he actually detested the kind of hierarchical and elite-centered politics that Plato stood for. In fact, if there's one theme that runs throughout all of James's work, it's the idea that common people have the capacity to create a better world without leaders, without top-down rule, and without hierarchy. In James, then, we find an argument not only for the importance of struggle from below, but James, I also want to suggest, can be thought of as a border abolitionist, and perhaps more provocatively, as an anarchist. So two things need to be pointed out here uh, from the start. The first is that James actually wrote very little about borders themselves, even though he was himself subjected to border violence. In 1952, at the height of the McCarthy era, uh, he was detained at Ellis Island for six months, and he was subsequently uh, deported uh, to Britain. The second is that James would, I think, have been very displeased to uh, see his work being described as anarchist, right? It might be turning in his grave right now. Uh, for him, the prodonists and the vacunists, he wrote, they represent nothing but the petty bourgeois capitalistic influences in the proletariat. That's so clearly very critical of anarchism. And yet in spite of, this, of that, I think it's undeniable that James's writings are infused with an anti-statist sensibility. It's not a coincidence um, that his work has often been referred to as being anarchistic. Robin Blackburn, for example, describes him as an anarcho-Bolshevik, whereas E.B. Thompson has argued that James's work is characterized by an instinctive and unarticulated kind of anarchism. A year before James was detained on Ellis Island, he had in fact broken with Trotskyism, right, which is the theoretical framework that had informed his writings and his activism since the early 1930s. Together with Raya Dunayevskaya and Grace Lee Box, he instead began to develop a piercing critique of the failure of the socialist movement to distance itself from the state project. The Soviet Union, he argued, was not socialist at all. It was merely a version of state capitalism. So a central theme in James's work is very much a challenge to, to, to the idea that liberation is something that can be delivered by the state. The new society, he argued, will only come from below, from the autonomous struggles of the oppressed and the exploited, whether they be found in Haiti, in Ghana, or in Brixton. My idea of socialism, he ultimately concluded, is very extremely opposed to the usual. For many people, socialism is the further control by people who put in authority. For me, it's the opposite. As his pamphlet from 1956 puts it, every cook can govern. Now, 
Like James, right, Robinson also questioned hierarchical modes of governance. Similar to James, he was also deeply critical of uh, the Western tradition of anarchism, which he saw as a false alternative to bourgeois racial order. And just as with James, right, I still think that it's undeniable that Robinson's writings are infused with an anti-statist imagination. In this book here, Terms of Order, that was the first text, um, the first book that he published that came out in 1980. He, in some ways, sets out to rethink anarchism through the concept of what he calls the anti-political. The book examines how the question of governability has come to dominate Western political thought. In short, why has political theory come to associate politics with rulership, with sovereignty, and with hierarchy? Robinson argues that this model of politics as governance is something that dates back to Plato's Republic, but that it gained widespread currency in the 14th century with the advent of the racial capitalist world system. Since then, politics has revolved around the single question of how to be governed. He writes, governing justly, unjustly, singly or by elite, democratically or dictatorially, momentarily or for imperial durations, consensually or by force, wisely or wrongly, but nonetheless governing. Within this framework, what is taken for granted is nothing less than, than the assumption that political subjects, the masses, they must be ruled, right? They can't govern themselves. Robinson and James both call this assumption into question, right? If capitalism emerged alongside a particular conception of politics anchored in this anti-democratic and hierarchical question of how to be ruled, then the anti-political names a revolutionary project which exceeds the racial capitalist state and is violent terms of order. So what then right, does all of this mean for how we think about border violence and the struggle for migrant justice? Well, when read through Robinson and James, I think the border emerges as one site in a much wider struggle against racial capitalism, the state system, and their necropolitical terms of order. Right? This is an abolitionist project, but it's one that goes beyond merely calling for a defunding of prisons, borders, and detention centers, and which instead bursts open this much bigger question of how to not be governed at all. James and Robinson both remind us right, that vagrants, fugitives, indentured workers, and the poor historically have led this struggle. And this, of course, is true today, as we see with the Gilinois uh, and with other communities and organizers that continue to refuse the border, that halt deportation flights, that organize against the sweatshop, and that contest corporate land grabs. In essence, people on the move and people that are stuck continue to point towards an anti-political horizon of autonomy, care, and belonging beyond the racial capitalist state and its violent bordering practices. Like James and like Robinson, these communities know that the border, right, and with that, the wider system of extraction, exploitation, and expropriation that it upholds, they must become ungovernable. So let me end by giving you an example of this by briefly taking you to Glasgow, where hundreds of locals blockaded Kenya Street on the 13th of May last year in order to stop an immigration raid by the UK Home Office. Two Indian nationals who'd been living in the UK for more than 10 years, Lakhwe Singh and Sumit Sedev, had been detained by immigration officers. As the hours were on, the crowd on Kenya Street kept on getting bigger and bigger as more and more people surrounded the van in which the two men were kept. Parents who had just, kept up, who had just picked up their kids from school, local shopkeepers who handed out drinks and snacks, and the large Muslim community who had been celebrating Eid in the nearby mosque. These are our neighbors, let them go, they shouted. After an eight hour standoff, saying and Sadev were finally released to the cheers of the crowd. The unnamed activist who had first climbed under the home of his van and who remained there for the full eight hours afterwards explained that he'd been able to hear Singh and Sadev stamping their feet in unison with the chants. He said, I never got to talk to them, maybe I never will, but we were that close. Only a steel chassis separated us. 
almost as if borders and barriers don't mean shit. If freedom is a place, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore suggests, then movements and communities such as this one render migrant justice part of a bigger project of placemaking, as the freedom to leave and the freedom to stay, and as the horizon of having a home in a world without statist homelands. I think Sadia Hartman brilliantly captures what this horizon uh, looks like. Um, in Lose Your Mother, she writes, and it's with these words uh, that I wish to end. Hartman writes, the legacy that I chose to claim was articulated in the ongoing struggle to escape, stand down and defeat slavery in all of its myriad forms. It was the fugitive's legacy. It didn't require me to wait on a bended knee for a great emancipator. It wasn't the dream of a White House, even if it was in Harlem but of a free territory. It was a dream of autonomy rather than nationhood. It was a dream of an elsewhere with all of its promises and dangers where the stateless might at last thrive. Thank you. That's a really great question, thank you. Um, I mean, I would argue that the two are not separated, right? Obviously, if we stay focused on the Mediterranean, what comes into view immediately is that necropolitical spectacle. I think that there's a danger in terms of only focusing on that. I think we miss sight of what happens to people if and when they manage to enter the continent. And in fact, I would suggest, right, that it's that kind of, of violence that then sustains, right, the forms of extraction and exploitation that people are then forced to live with. Um, so maybe that's a bit of a cop out, but I think there's both going on at the same time. Um, yeah, and it's that kind of border violence that then makes possible yeah. these forms of extraction and exploitation within Europe. Yeah. Who would like to ask a question? It's a good observation, right? And so you're 100% right in thinking that I don't want to give up on, on the idea of solidarity. Of course not. What I am critical of in White Innocence in the Black Mediterranean, which I think is the paper uh, that you're referring to, is this idea, right, that, that empathy, the idea of hospitality, of a welcoming culture, is the solution, right, to this violence. And the argument that I make is that in some ways this is reproducing the idea of white innocence, right? Very good white uh, liberal Europeans that are open to strangers. And then we don't have to confront, right, the colonial history, so why it is that certain people are on the move in the first instance. So I'm very critical of that. I think that these forms of solidarity uh, that I was alluding to at the end are a little bit different from that, right? Because they directly target state violence, right? And they call that out. Um, I would think, right, that Kenya Street is 
in some ways part of a kind of wider movement right, that are calling for them. Not just for more open borders, right, but they say that these systems are rotten to the bone, right, and they must be gotten rid of, right. And a lot of that work is kind of anchored in an attempt to think about how these borders emerge from a history which is deeply colonial. And so I would say that this is very different compared to some of those liberal articulations of hospitality uh, and empathy uh, that I'm critical of. I mean, maybe to clarify, right, like this terminology of the anti-political really um, is something that emerges from Robinson's work. I'm not the only one who's using right, that language today, but it's really from uh, Terms of Order, right, which is the book that I was showing on the screen uh, before. I think that it's easy to maybe misunderstand that for something which is apolitical, which is not at all the point, right? It's rather that the analysis that Robinson gives us is this idea that the state is implicated with the market, right? Uh, and it's a, it's a wider political imagination around how we organize ourselves as a society and so on, and which is fundamentally entwined with what he calls racial capitalism. And so the anti-political in that sense names, I mean, I don't want to say another word as possible, but it names something else, right, that we can find in in histories of, fug of fugitivity in maroon societies, for example, um, <coughs> which runs maybe not outside of the system, right? But it is, in some ways, right, a form of refusal of that system. And so it's really right from there uh, that I'm taking this terminology. I don't know if that begins to answer uh, yeah, no, what you were I trying to get at. I'm not sure because, maybe it's because I don't come from a background in aesthetics and so I'm not invested in that term, um, but maybe if you can say a little bit more in terms of what you think is at stake in terms of calling this an aesthetic imagination. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I think I have to think about that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you for that. That's an excellent question and a very good observation, right? That I mean, 
I think you're absolutely right to suggest, right, that like borders are both racializing and gendering. I wouldn't want to take away uh, from that, right? I mean, and C. Law James doesn't talk about this. Selma certainly does, right, in her work. Uh, I mean, lots of people have written on this. Uh, I think Anne McClintock was mentioned before lunch, right, uh, where she tries to think about these things together. So sex workers, in her analysis, were often also blackened, right? They were imagined to be a species completely different from the from the deserving poor. And so I think there's absolutely a bit of both going on, right? Um, some of the first border restrictions that were put in place and settler colonies, right, targeted directly people that were classified as sex workers, right? And so race and gender kind of operate together in many of these uh, scenarios. So yeah, I think you're right uh, to point to that. Um, I mean, beyond that, I think what I'm trying to say by pointing to these mechanisms as being both racialized and racializing is to move away from some kind of essentialist understanding, right, of what these categories of difference are. I mean, they're constantly renewed and reinvented by various forms uh, of state violence. And I think that border, borders are not the only, right, state institutions uh, that do that, but they're one of the, of the main, um, I would argue. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. No, oh. sorry, behind you. <laughs> I think the honest answer is that I'm not 100% sure, right? Uh, I'm very critical of the ways that certain uh, feelings around uh, empathy or innocence and so on are invoked. Um, I think I also see a point for anger, right, as we see here. Um, but I'm not sure that I have a theory of affects in and of themselves uh, and the ways in which they're kind of attached to uh, materialist foundations. But yeah, be interested to think together with many of you on that question. I think it's, a, it's just like a bit of mm. an add, to, add on to that. I think it's a super valid question because also in my view, I think it's such a central position in your work because you're so good at identifying, I think, the power structures that are in both the affect. Um, but you don't have to be an affect theorist to do that, I think. It's just, I think, um, That's a, that's a really helpful question, uh, thank you. I mean, I think the first thing to say, right, is that, I mean, that the canon of anarchist thought is very white and very European, right? Uh, fine, the Russians, right, Bakunin, but otherwise, uh, that body of literature has historically focused on, on European thinkers, uh, to some extent the United States, right, but it's really the Paris Commune, the Haymarket Affair, they're kind of celebrated as being the moments when anarchism really happened, right? And what's really missing from that are not only, right, the people of color that have written very actively, right, on the state and its violence, but we also don't get an account of the ways in which abolition, for example, might have been an anarchist moment. Um, and so yeah, so right, there's a kind of critique of, of anarchism, uh, which I think is valid and, and important. Recently, there's lots of people right, that are trying to recover a different form of anarchism, and I would think of myself as being part of that literature. So people like uh, Marquis Bay, Zoe Samudzi, William C. Anderson, Celia Hartman as well, right? Are kind of thinking about the ways in which abolition, in a way, is a form of anarchism, right? That kind of horizon or that kind of future that they are imagining in a way also requires right, the undoing of the state uh, and of its violence. Uh, so I would absolutely position myself as kind of being part of that literature. And these are scholars right, that I draw on and I think, yeah, just enrich my, 
my thinking on these topics. I would like to push a little bit more on this question because mm -hmm. I was also wondering about the theoretical stakes maybe of calling something anarchism. I think I also encountered that lately in the discussion around Walter Benjamin and was an anarchist or you know how, mm. to, how to read that kind of mm. literature. And I think it's interesting with that, just with that term of anarchism, it always like invokes this quite specific and often also quite male history um, that is also, like that, that is I think, or an image of radicalism is somehow attached to it and also values it mm. so much. Um, so I think maybe that's a bit of a question of like your specific relation to it. Mm. What do you think will be won by calling something anarchism mm. rather than sticking with maybe the more um, yeah, rhymed or dispersed idea of abolition that isn't, you know, that isn't a political mm. idea in the same way or not in the same way? Yeah. That's a great question. Thank you, Enrique. Um, I I think that one of the things that labeling abolition mm -hmm. as anarchist does is, I think it rescues that term from being hijacked by liberals. Right? Like it's very prominent right now how there's a kind of liberal move to kind of turn it into a kind of defund, right? Uh, and also kind of finger pointing that these are the state institutions that are bad, but here are the other ones that maybe could be rescued, right? If we only invested in them and so on. Uh, and I think what anarchism does is that it suggests that actually all of these institutions that we collectively call the state right, is rotten um, to the core. I mean, black feminists have done fantastic work in terms of pointing to the violence of, I mean, the social welfare system. Dorothy Roberts has a new book on family policing that gets precisely to this. Um, and so again, what anarchism does in that context is to clarify right, that it's not so much a matter of shifting resources from one side to yeah. another, but rather thinking about as opposed to the totality of it all. Mm -hmm. Felix? Um, well, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, that was a really interesting example. That's what I'm asking now in my two presentations, because uh, <laughs> I absolutely agree with your overall approach, and I also found your paper really interesting, the white nationalism black men campaign. But I'm sort of taking issue with this notion of anti-policy. I mean, this is basically a very old debate between like Marxism versus anarchism. Mm -hmm. You position yourself very explicitly on one side, and so like I think um, some issues, some like historical issues with anarchism, really appear in this approach that you now gave us, um, and that is um, that sort of uh, like um, you have this like this very radical posture of everything is rotten to the core and we have to really like develop something completely new out of this. But like of course if you take like one step more practical, there are huge and many questions arising about how are we actually going to do that. And so I sort of sense a danger of like if you have a posture of too radical denial of everything that is positively implicit right now, then you sort of yeah, I mean <coughs> all, you have, all you still can do is like utopian lament about how bad everything is. And so I want to maybe ask you if you have a general, but not like completely political idea, but like a general notion of what the subject of this radical change might be nowadays, and how they are living, how they can like uh, maybe develop this sort of solidarity that's a really great question thank you um i mean i would first of all say right that i don't think I mean, it's not my task as a scholar <laughs> to tell movements what they should and shouldn't be doing i think beyond that i mean there are movements and communities that are already doing this kind of work every day right i mean can can you speak just one example of immigration rates that have been stopped recently, right, in the UK. Uh, I imagine that these things are happening across Germany uh, as well. So these discourses are very much out there and kind of circulating. It's interesting to see how links are being drawn between the border and the prison, right, like across nation-state borders as well. And so 
again, yes, like I take your point, but there's a danger in saying that everything is horrific and bleak and so on. I think if we just open our eyes and if we look, we will see that this work is ongoing and it's just a matter of making sure that we ourselves put our bodies on the streets, right? And become part of that. Um, yeah. That's very helpful. I mean, maybe to take this to a more um, abstract and theoretical level. I mean, I think I would say that one of the things that I'm trying to do is to think about the ways in which, you know, the political and the economic or law and accumulation of state and market, right? Like that, to come back to the point about language, right? Like that language is insufficient because these entities have never been entirely separate, right? Uh, and the idea of like political economy only begins to get at it. So you're entirely right to suggest that, of course, you know, the violence of bordering is not only carried out by the state, right? I mean, many of us are implicated in those structures. Um, I mean, I teach at the university, I take attendance, and that data is available to the Home Office, for example, right? That will check to make sure that students are there, uh, right? And that's then run past their visas and so on. And so, in many ways, like many of us are also border guards, whether we know it or not. And so, yeah, you're entirely right uh, to point to that. Um, but yeah, I think, again, what I'm trying to suggest on a more theoretical level is that that separation between state and market is, at the end of the day, not particularly helpful, right? And that's why people like C.L.R. James or why Cedric Robinson, for me, are so immensely productive, right? because they kind of tease out that history of how they actually emerged together and have, be and have been codependent uh, from the start. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, because I found this thing which in Hicke uh, said before quite interesting, like, oh, why do we label something as anarchism? That maybe it has this like, very long, white, Eurocentric history attached to it. And I'm wondering if there's a bit like this, um, maybe materialist analysis. I'm, I'm very in depth with you for this essay for it being so materialist, and I think we have to make it historic, we have to make it materialist, we have to make it Marxist in a certain way. But I'm wondering whether like affect is not like pointing to other aspects which might be important and which might be missing in this like very male materialist culture. And I mean like I think there is like some advantage to also understand that like, the affect which is going on in movements and why are we like concerned about something, why how are we attached? And I was wondering whether we can say something like affect from just being about like white innocence and maybe even thinking it through like I don't know, black theories, because you've been like CLR like James Robinson, they're very charismatic leaders, you know, like they're they're using affect. And whether there's not like maybe a, a way of also saving affect and not making it as white and still making it kind of materialist, which I think is a struggle of affect studies to do that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was quite curious about that you've also like you've chosen like these people which I find also super nice for the analysis. Mm -hmm. um. Again, um 
I mean, I think the first thing that I would point out, right, cards on the table are very much come from materialist tradition, as you've been able to tell today, right? And so for me, right, to theorize feelings or emotions or affects, right, needs to be done with that materialist consideration in mind, right? Like, I want to know about the, like, the power plays, like who gains and who losses at the end of the day, uh, and so on. Um, I'm not sure that I'm the person <laughs> to do that. Again, this is not my terrain and not my discipline. I've come to it, I think, through thinking through how some of these feelings are mobilized, right, in highly, like, authoritarian ways, right, in ways that are very conservative. Um, and so on. But the question of like, is this something to redeem or something to recover? I mean, maybe that's something that we should all have a conversation about. I mean, we had one take on it uh, this morning. Um. Um, I was Yeah, I think I might have to ask you to repeat some of that because you're so far away. But I heard something about empirics in the beginning, right? And like, and where can we see the ungovernability in the world? I mean, I think, uh, like, uh, my talk today was just as much a kind of an empirical statement of how different movements and communities are trying to act. That is also a kind of call to arms, right? That like, let's become uh, ungovernable, uh, right? So like, uh, people struggling against borders in this way, right, would constitute one example. Obviously, right, like police, uh, prison abolition, I think are another a crucial site what that has been happening in the last few years. Um, I mean, I would also, you know, just name, right, like indigenous struggles against extraction that are also kind of being engaged in similar uh, forms of refusal uh, and so on. And so, you know, I think, again, the examples are there if we only have to look. Ah, I see, yeah. I see, yeah. Yeah. Right, so what interests me here in this example is the form of refusal, right, that these communities are enacting, which is very different compared to these discourses around human rights or international law or citizenship, right, a kind of politics of recognition, right. This is a form of, I mean, if we can call it politics or anti-politics, right, which is rather rejecting that system altogether and the sense that this is not good enough. Right? We want something else, we want something better. And for me, like that's the side of ungovernability, that it's a kind of rejection or a refusal of that very state logic. Does that, yeah, <laughs> kind of begin uh, to answer what you had in mind? We have two more questions from Lisa. Uh, yeah. um, you're, in some ways, you've already answered my question, but, but so I'll just state it as a question. Um, and it gets back to this, this uh, concept of abolition. Mm. 
<laughs> so often the way that I think of abolition is both as uh, a struggle to destroy and dismantle and get rid of something, uh, and connected with that, and not necessarily as a second moment, but sometimes as the condition for the possibility of, say, in Angela Davis' mm -hmm. making prisons obsolete, the work of, of experimenting Thank you, Lisa. That's really helpful. Um, like in many ways, I think that the history of borders is a very good example of what you precisely pointed to there, right? This danger of we just want to build our borders, then they'll give that to us, and right, is that the end of the struggle? And if you study the history of borders, then you will see that immigration restrictions, the way we have them today, are very much born in the moment when slavery is abolished across the British Empire, right? And that's when the history of indentured labour gets going, right? And the paperwork that is necessary to enter a new territory is kind of invented, right? And so, like, victory, if you want to call it that, in one struggle is immediately translated into another form of governing mobility, right? And so I think there's 100% a danger there in thinking that the only thing that we want is a world without borders, right? The other ways of controlling mobility, and you know? so we have to be careful uh, with that. I absolutely take your point about, of course, right, if you think about abolition or anarchism, these are two pong projects that are about destruction, but also about, I mean, building alternative freer worlds and so on. I can see how certainly within the history of anarchism, an emphasis on the latter there has sometimes led people away from thinking about the destruction of the world as we know it, right? Um, I mean, post-anarchism is a very good example of that but all of a sudden what becomes important is the idea of practicing alternative lifestyles in the society in which we have. And that kind of raises the question, well, if those alternative lifestyles are possible within the current structure, then what is it that we actually have to change? Right? And so I think that danger is there. I'm just not sure that the solution to that is to say that we shouldn't care about thinking about what forms of community and care and autonomy and relationality might we want to build. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I think my answer to that would be caution, right? And constantly being aware of these things. Yeah. Okay, last question from Lara. Question be quick. Um, so this is also about anarchism and the history, mm -hmm. um, which you claim to be mainly European. So I wonder, because recently I heard this talk from Stephanie uh, Vera Verus, she is researching at Marquette, 
and she um, like somehow unearthed this figure from the archives, which is Misa Campesito, um, which is Puerto Rican anarchist, um, and um, was very active and tried to combine anarchism with spiritism, mm -hmm. um, like in the Caribbean discourse, and she also was arrested in 1925 for wearing pants in, in Havana. Um, so I wondered if it's not a possibility to, if we confront the archive, to somehow tell other histories of anarchism and yeah, then how this would influence um, mm. what you talk about this. Yeah. Story. That's a great question, and I'm glad you asked that because it gives me an opportunity to clarify what I meant, right? So I don't mean that the history of anarchist pra practice is white or European, right? What I was saying is that the, the anarchist canon has tended to be written in such a way as if to imply, right, that it's inherently European and so on, right? Like, of course, right, we can find anarchist archives across the world in many ways, like, I mean, anti-colonialism, right, had anarchist strains, even today, even though today we tend to remember it as a form of nationalist movement, right? And in some ways, what those histories have even been removed or forgotten about and so on. Um, but I think it, you could argue, right, that anarchism has predominantly been like a non-European phenomenon, but it has been studied in such a way as if to suggest, right, that it is European. And so like, that's the kind of argument that I was trying to make. Um, so yeah, point well taken. Uh, it would also be a strategy to just use those other archives as not trying to repeat mm. that the canon is too wide. Yeah. Yeah. Did James do something for this? I mean, she's doing that with James. <laughs> 